and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Episode 70, It Takes Two, Great Two-Player Cooperative Games. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, and and that's at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Uh, tonight, we are answering a question I've been putting off for some time about two-player cooperative games. I've also got a review of Imhotep, Builder of Egypt, and we're going to talk some digital gaming in our Week in Review section. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, whether positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, you can send an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right, up first, a comment going way back to episode 36, Wedding Bells. Chanel M. commented on the YouTube version of this episode to say, super helpful. Thank you. Well, thanks for the comment, Chanel. Plus, I have a feeling congratulations are in order. Next, a comment from Chris Groff on our list of gamers for four to six players for a casual game night, featured way back in episode 48 of our podcast, Fly Casual. Chris writes, good list. And good points. When we gather with friends over the holidays, most of our favorites made your list. I'd add Ingenious Classic, still an excellent abstract for two to four players. Ticket to Ride always brings out the competitive nature of people, but it's not so heavy as to require complete focus. Formula D is a similar game space and can support a large group. Dice Forge has become a recent favorite for us as well. It's perhaps a little more thinky, but easy to teach and a very active game. Well, thanks for this comment, Chris, and regularly interacting with our content. Ingenious, I think, is a fantastic recommendation. It's a great game. Four players is the best way to play that one. Uh, Ticket Ride, not one of my favorites, but it's definitely popular. Uh, Dice Forge, I've only played that one online. That's one I need to play in person. Uh, it does seem a bit fiddly to me. You kind of mentioned it's a little more thinky. I haven't tried that with a big group. But I do have to comment on Formula D. I personally can't agree with that recommendation for a casual game night. While the game sounds great in theory, especially with its ability to play up to 10 players, there are a couple issues I find with it. And the main thing is that the game is long and I find it often overstays its welcome, especially if you play a full game, which has a qualifying lap and two full laps. But even if you decide just to play a single lap, that can take a long time, especially with 10 players, especially if you're at a social gathering. If you're there to play games, sure, but if you're also there to mingle and have some food, it just seems to stay a little too long. The other problem I have ties in with that in that if you don't play a full game, you'll have a big runaway leader problem because with fewer laps, you don't have to worry about wear and tear on your vehicles. And once a couple cars get ahead on the track, it becomes almost impossible to catch up. Whereas in the full game, the wear mechanic makes up for that. Those people that push hard at the beginning are going to have to slow down at the end. When you're playing just one lap, I find that like halfway through the players in the lead are having a great time. You know, the, the pole position, third, fourth, maybe even fifth are having a great time. But those players in last pl place are just picking up the dice and dropping them and moving their characters. Uh, in, the tra in the chat room, Trasharama mentions uh, Downforce is uh, his better version of Formula D. Yeah, I haven't tried that one. I have heard it's a, it's a different style of game, probably more of a party, definitely a lighter game than Formula D. I do like Formula D, but for me, that's an event game. That's something I, I actually planned it ahead of time. Uh, I brought it out whenever we've done sports-themed game nights, or we've actually done racing game nights. I brought it out for that. Now, one final comment this week comes from Deb Deb on Twitter, who is from White Wizard Games, who I had the pleasure of meeting at Origins this year. Deb was commenting on her list of great gateway games that came out in the last three years. She wrote, We played Gizmos at BGG Con and had fun with it. Also played Quirky Circuits, Wingspan, and Quacks recently, and I think they're all also good choices for newer games. Oh, and then there's these games, Star Realms and Hero Realms. Well, thanks, Deb. Uh, I know Mo mentioned in Twitter that Star Realms is a bit long in the tooth for that three-year list, 
though yeah. we are big fans of it. Uh, Hero Realms is one of those on the list games that looks amazing, but just hasn't gotten picked up by any of us yet. Yeah, I just uh, haven't tried it. I just haven't gotten around to it. I think part of it is a lot of people, oh, it's it's Fantasy Star Realms. I'm like, oh, I played Star Realms. It looks good. It looks cool. It just, sorry, I haven't gotten around to that one. There's just so many games out there. Yep. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around after the show and where we continue on for our after show. Uh, tonight, we've had a little bit of discussion. We've had uh, a new, uh, reasonably new game, 2018 game, uh, which was that Soviet Kitchen Unleashed. Uh, Trash Realm is telling us they played that five times today and had a great time with it. Yeah, not one I know at all. I've never heard of that one. I got to get caught up on podcasts. I am so, I'm so... We we were on the on the cusp of being about the new hotness there with Call of Cthulhu and <laughs> and uh, all the Ravensburger uh, games, Ravensburger games there for a bit. But you know what? We're we're still you know about the new hotness from 2013 or so most of the time. So I'm starting to catch up. I've, I've been spending a lot of time on my computer in the last weeks. So I'm down to I think 350 podcasts behind, which is pretty which good when it was over 500. <laughs> yeah, like so I'm getting there. We're we're past origins now, so. I'm getting the, I'm getting the news about Gen Con at this time, so. Oh. Oh, it, it's it's been pretty good. Um, we also have someone requesting we make a strange brew game. It could be big up here. I uh, I think I don't know if there's a lot of overlap between strange brew fans and board game fans, unless I, you went with a casual mass market style game. I think like, you definitely it's gotta have to be a, a little more casual, game, right? Yeah. Like, uh, MGM like I'm not, I'm not, interestingly enough seems to own most of the rights. They are the sole distributor of that game. Yeah, so uh, there's no so, way we're, we're getting any strange brew rights, that's for sure. <laughs> there is no way at all we are getting, getting strange brew rights, so I'm sure we can come up with something. I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't even know what you do with strange brew. Yep. A deck builder, maybe. I, I don't know. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, it's been a long enough since I've watched that movie that uh, I would just have to, you know, watch it again and sort of see if anything inspirationally uh popped up in a in a thematic mechanic right yeah i don't know or, or maybe some kind of do it like a big trouble in a little china with all the miniatures yeah it's and you possible. have a story book like an adventure book where you pick which way and not do you put a mouse in the beer bottle or <laughs> not there we go you learn the song so you can control the hockey players <laughs> uh uh, All right, so today we are tackling a question from one of our lobby regulars, Red Meeple Ryan or Ryan Peach. He asked me about two-player games a long time ago, and I figured it was about time I answered Ryan's question. Now, as usual for these game recommendation episodes, we will be looking to the lobby for any games we miss. We'll be back checking in the lobby a few more times throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go on over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. That way they don't get lost in the mix. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we've got a question from Ryan Peach, who writes, looking for a good two-player co-op, specifically two-player only. As a blind meeple asking this question, I'd mentally discounted many games. I play with Sighted Assistance, a game where the second player does something different but still interesting, and where both parties can talk to each other would do. All right, first off, I do have to say, sorry, Ryan, I do apologize for taking so dang long to get to this question. There's a reason for this, though. I, I don't really have a good answer for you, still. I have had this question sitting in the queue for over a year, like since we started the podcast, this is literally one of the first questions we ever got. And I see it now and then every time I go, Oh, what are we going to talk about this week? I see this come up and I go, Oh, there's gotta be one. There's gotta be something. So I go searching and I try to find an accessible two player cooperative game. And I fail time and time again. You know, and I think one strong problem is that there still isn't enough push for companies to ensure they are accessible, or at the very least, indicate in what ways they are accessible in a standardized manner across the industry. I know Ryan has cited assistance, but in a game 
for instance, where every card has a paragraph of text to play it? How enjoyable yeah. is that game going to be for either player with all that going on? Yeah. Now, there are some games that we can definitely recommend. The problem is that two-player only part of Ryan's question, because there's almost no two-player only cooperative games in general, accessible or, or not. Uh, the first one that comes to mind that I played and own was in Then We Held Hands. This is a very cool card game where players work together playing two-sided cards where you can see the backs of my cards and I, I can see the, the fronts of my cards and the backs of your cards. And we're using each other's hands to try to move gems on a board to try to get them to meet. And it's a really unique theme where you're actually having an argument and trying to get along by using different arguments. It's, it's very cool, very solid game. But there is no way a vision impaired person is going to be able to play this game. And especially there's not this isn't one where you can help your opponent because you have to be able to see each other's cards. That's how the whole game works. So it totally disqualifies from Ryan's question here. Yeah, it's true. I think a lot of times when designers think co-op, they think group, not pair. Uh, though often they'll insert ways to play it as a duo, duo often yeah. doubling up on characters, especially as a method to bring that player count down. Yeah. Now, another one that's come out, and I think it came out since Ryan asked me the question, because I don't remember catching it right away, was Codenames Duet. Now, this is a two-player-only version of Codenames. And again, this is a two-player-only co-op, perfect for what Ryan wants, but I can't see someone with sighted assistance playing Codenames. Like, that's just not going to work. <laughs> like, you're going to have one person playing both sides if they're going to have to read out what all the cards are. I guess they could say, here's what all the cards that are out now are. I, maybe it's possible. Yeah, just a quick glance through the rules indicates that while it could be made as an accessible game, in its current state, it's just not. Uh, if you aren't able to read, identify color, identify physical actions, and point to individual identified cards without another person's without that other person's assistance, it just doesn't seem feasible. Yeah. So now there is one. There actually is one game out there that perfectly fits the bill. Like it, it really does. But it's got a rather unique theme, and I personally don't know if Ryan would be interested in this, and that is Consentical. This is a two-player cooperative game about a consensual sexual encounter between a curious human and a tentacled alien. Yeah, this one really depends on who you're playing with and the comfort levels between that person. Uh, if you're playing with your assistance person who happens to be a family member, you might want to stay clear of this because things could get weird. Yes. So I don't know. There, there is our one recommendation. We, we do have one game for you, Ryan, that is a two player cooperative only that we think is accessible, though you may not want to play that with very many people <laughs> and possibly not in public. So oh. I guess that's our official answer, right? Um, I don't have more to offer at this point. Now, I do see Xanister in the chat is talking about Street Masters. That's not one I know, so maybe that's one we can look into while we keep going. So what I'm going to do here, because I don't have more to say, is we're going to deep dive some of the best two-player cooperative games without the two-player-only limitation. We'll remove that limitation. We're going to look at multiple-player co-op games that are great with two players. Now, there's a bit of a caveat here. Many of the games I'm going to mention tonight I haven't personally played. See, the person I'm most likely to play a two-player game with is Deanna over there. And while Deanna pretty much hates most cooperative games, like I'm still kind of shocked we got her to sit down with Tori and Kat to play through Pandemic Legacy and then got her into Gloomhaven as well. But those are rare exceptions of games she actually enjoys. So I don't get a lot of chance to actually play two-player cooperative games. Actually, we there's a small subset of two-player games we even play, and none of them are cooperative. So just so you know, the following list is a mix of my personal experience, games I played, or a pretty common consensus found throughout bloggers and podcasters, games that come up on multiple best lists and board game geek ratings. Well, and I have to say, you know, we don't actually have it in this list, but she did like Horrified. Yes, she did <laughs> like it. There are a few. She likes yeah. Ghostbusters, and everyone hates that game, so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, up first, I think uh, the game uh, cooperative game that we all know and uh, consider as part of the uh, the, you know, envelope of tabletop bellhop games. Gloomhaven. Yeah, that would be Gloomhaven. The, the, the number one game in the world still still rated number one. And I think for good reason that may change. I don't know if people have seen it yet, but Frosthaven was announced today an official full sequel, full new campaign, all new characters. 
Uh, until that comes out, though, there is Gloomhaven. Um, Gloomhaven, I, best with three. You probably don't want to do what I'm doing and play it with four because it gets really hard, but really good with two. And I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be accessible with a helper. Now, you definitely need the helper, but I, again, I don't know. How, it depends on your level of visual acuity and what you can and can't do. But if it's a matter of seeing things on the map and be able to move things on the map, that's all going to be accessible. You may need someone to read off the cards, but even the um, the combat cards are very clear and bright with large symbols. It's it's even larger than most. Um, what do you call that? I can't think of the word for the the big text that you can get for people with vision impaired. But it's all large, bright text. But then the cards is tons of tiny text that the order of the text matters, and it's very fiddly. So that's where you may need some help. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I think Gloom is definitely something that's that's accessible with assistance. Uh, you, you would, I, I, there's too much reading, I think, to uh, to not have either a, uh, well, yeah, you know, I say that, but there are a number of PDF versions of everything available that will not even blow up, but re- could be yeah. used into, uh, into a reader. Um, although controlling where you start in the manual, I suppose, could be uh, a little tough, but I, I think there are probably reader-capable uh, versions of that manual available now. I wonder uh, if anyone has put the decks of cards well, in the yeah. PDF. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I would be surprised if they hadn't. Uh, but also, the Gloomhaven helper apps, there may be one. There are so many Gloomhaven helper out, uh, apps out there. There may be some that are either uh, screen reader capable or already enabled. Uh, to uh to work in that manner yes so that that may actually work yeah. so i said gloomhaven now you're you're looking at a investment it is not a cheap game uh i would recommend if you're planning to play with a partner you and the partner split the cost at least at that point yep. uh but you are going to get a lot of gameplay out of this like we have been playing it for over a year not every friday but pretty often doing um pretty often playing almost every friday and we still got a long way to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the the one thought is if you do have a play space you can dedicate to it, that does make things easier mm. because the setup and teardown is uh, is trying. But if you do have to set up and tear down, I think we we definitely recommend a uh, insert of some sort. Yeah. Uh, going going on that going with that game with just the default uh, packaging is not. Well, at uh, least some ideal. packaging. It doesn't necessarily have to be a purchased. But some uh, form, insert, yeah, but some like form of insert uh, some management form of organization, organization is required yeah. Tupperware or otherwise. Um, so Ryan's in the chat says, yeah, he stepped back from Gloomhaven as a game that seems to have a lot of little rough edges. Um, but he's not averse to uh, dungeon crawlers. So what I was wondering, Ryan, is how accessible for your particular vision problems would Gloomhaven be? How, like, obviously, I, I I don't know your personal state. To, to, <laughs> I know you can see somewhat, right? Like I know what you need assistance with. I just wonder how accessible Gloomhaven is considered overall. Obviously not completely accessible. You would need help. Yeah. Um, and again, we're talking about uh, Gloomhaven, the, still the number one game out there, best with three players, but totally accessible as a game with two players um, or even solo for that matter. So, yes. although not, not accessible accessible as solo it's it's playable yes. as solo it's, it's playable as solo i don't again I, it definitely has some accessibility issues but there's like there's no dice it's cards so if you had a way to read the cards or if and like i said the cards in that game it's like the the combat deck is nice and big and bright it's mm-hmm. the action cards right so i guess his biggest problem is, is other people who might be willing to help and play with him in that in that game yeah so, it, so it's more the, the, the patience of the other players yeah no absolutely That's, fair uh, enough um right all right so up next i've got spirit island this is a game basically that sat there and a bunch of people went you know what i'm really sick of is all these games about exploitation and colonialism and glorification of war how about we turn it around and let's make a cooperative game where we play the spirits defending an island from colonizers which i think is a really cool theme 
Uh, this one comes up as strongly recommended at two players on Board Game Geek, and I've seen it on multiple lists as a game. Looking at the pieces, I got to say, it looks like they made the wooden bits all different. So they're all different shapes. They're all different sizes. So it's not just a bunch of cubes. But I don't know much more about the game to know how accessible it may be. Yeah, I have to say, every two-player cooperative list I saw... Yeah, has this. Yeah, Spirit Island is on it, period. Um, it is rated as an 8.3 on BGG. Now, it's not light, though. It is, uh, it is a 3.92 uh, weight. So you're, you're definitely on the high end of the scale when it comes to weight. And you're looking at about a two-hour playtime as well. Yeah, this is, so. this is a heavier game. Now, I know it does include things like the player boards, like the Terra Mystica or Gaia Project. So everything's on your board. Everything's very tactile. I, again, not, being, not having vision problems myself, just looking at it from a third person, it looks like, excuse me, it has some things that were done to make the game more accessible. Now, Ryan in the chat, unfortunately, hasn't played or seen Spirit Island to, to be able to tell us if we're on the money with this one or not. Yeah, I see some I see some potential color problems. Uh, some of the uh, some of the, some of these items are, are are looking a little a little similar. But in general, the overall feel of it is is very different shapes, um, yeah. shapes and sizes. There's just this one type of piece um of its of the worshiper huts i guess uh that that could get a little uh dicey on color but uh generally again not as an expert but uh my limited experience says that uh, spirit island looks like it's got some strong potential all right up next i've got seventh continent now i know this is completely card driven but this seems like it would be really good with a helper this isn't something you're going to be able to play on your own, but this seems like the perfect kind of puzzle, which way story exploration experience that I think could be great for two players and to sit down and play. From what I understand, this is the kind of game where basically you guys can sit on a couch, you guys and girls, sorry, you folk could sit on a couch and sit back and one person could be doing all the work with the cards while the other person still interacts and enjoys the game. Uh, and this is the the seventh continent, the seventh continent, correct? Yes, the seventh continent, yeah. um, which was re implementing, uh, re implemented in uh, this year by the seventh continent classic edition. Yeah, um, they just keep putting out more kickstarters. Yeah, to, they, to reprint this. As soon as it goes out of print, they put out another one. Yeah, there's there's it, a whole lot of versions of this if you start searching it. Uh, but the seventh continent is where you wanna where you wanna start. Um, so. Yeah, this uh, is one Ryan's been curious about, thinks may work. So, sounds okay. good. Excellent. Uh, that was The Seventh Continent for, uh, with the Classic Edition coming out in 2019. All right, up next is Arkham Horror, the card game. Uh, if you want this one, rush to Amazon right now. They're cheap for, for Cyber Monday week. Uh, this is a collect non-collectible living card game. So, this is one of those games where you're going to buy the base game. You're probably going to want two copies of the base game because... Through you, Fantasy Flight, that's what you do to us. And then you're probably going to want expansions. And from what I hear, they have done some really evil things in this game to make it extremely difficult to win just with the base box to encourage you to buy expansions. Now, the thing is, with a co-op game, is you want extremely difficult, because that's what has you coming back for more. Now, what I don't know is this is rated as one of the best two-player cooperative experiences on the market by many people. I don't know how well it would work playing with a partner. I honestly don't know like you would obviously need help building your deck but i don't know how you would do actually playing like i don't know if it's a play your cards in front of you so your uh, partner can read them off to you or if it's picking or if you can play with open hands so that's the the accessibility issues on this i don't know but from what i understand this is like up there I, like this beats out gloomhaven for a two-player card experience uh judging by the uh play mats i see on bgg photos it does look like a play out in front of you. So it does. So that I don't should... think I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, just based on on the the, the uh, player images that are shown, uh, again by uh... now again you're putting a lot of work on your partner here because they're going to have to know your deck and their deck, and they're probably going to have to read out every card you draw, and you're going to have to remember which cards they are. Like I, I think it's going to be a little bit of weight, so you'll need someone who's got a full buy in to work together. But I think the discussion 
and the openness of the collectible card game of what 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 should we put in our deck before we play in the deck building aspect i think it'd be great with two people especially cited and non right because you can just sit there and while well, one person builds the deck the other oh how about that card remember the last time we lost because of this how about we put that in yeah. i think it might be really good it's just during play it could be rough yeah and uh it is rated number one as the number one customizable game yeah. out there right now. So oh, it's it's blowing everything away. And from what I understand, there was another game I, I had on the list and I took it off. This is a re-implementation of the Lord of the Rings card game from Fantasy Flight uh, that it was also a cooperative. And this supposedly does it significantly better. Right. Though, as Ryan puts out, points out, the trouble is it's keeping up with the releases, which is the problem with all these living card games. Yeah. It's it's not magic. I, I like the fact it's non collectible. But that doesn't mean you don't want to try to keep up with all of the releases. And Fantasy Flight loves to release new content for these games yeah. at a ridiculous amount. I almost recommend, as a someone who who is all about saving money on games, is wait till it dies. Like if I really wanted to get into Android Netrunner, now would be the time because it's dirt cheap everywhere now that they've canceled official support. If you're not planning on going to play in tournaments. Wait till the game's no longer in print. Wait till those things go down to three bucks at expansion pack on Amazon or your local game store is clearing it out because they've got the late new game in. Yep. And that was Arkham Horror, the card game. Up next, Mage Knight, the board game. I, I, I think if you did some very minor component upgrades changes this could be very accessible part of the game is collecting gems of different colors and it uses those crystals the plastic i don't know what the hell they're made of the acrylic i think they're acrylic crystals that are now popular in all board games right if you swap those up for different shapes for your different colors of mana and then this is a deck building game but like most deck building games when you're playing a deck builder you can very easily just dump your entire hand on the table and let the entire table see it and everyone can discuss what you can play and what you shouldn't of what you should and i think it would work really good that way again with a partner so if you have your partner there going all right what'd you draw this turn you lay out your hand oh okay i think you should go over there the board itself is a little small but um it uses clicks clicks are probably going to be a little hard to read but again someone else can read the stuff off there are dice involved but you have someone else reading the dice now this is a heavy um sean talked about wanting to leave gloomhaven set up you want to leave mage knight set up just to finish one game because you're looking at like sometimes six to eight hours gameplay for one scenario this is a bigger heavier game but something i would think you set up a weekend where your friend comes over and the two of you sit down and you hammer through the game over the weekend stopping for drinks coffees and possibly dinner i don't see any reason why this wouldn't work as a paired game accessibility wise but again, it is a four hour game with a weight of 4.2. So I, I think four is being generous Four <laughs> for people who know the game well from right. my experience. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a weighty game with a with a hunk of time. But again, yeah, other than those crystals, um, it does look like it is uh, more. Um, um, and Mage right, Knight, no, Mage Knight can be played multiple ways. One of the ways to play is cooperative. There you go. Um, yeah. So that was a Mage Knight board game. So now there is a new edition of that. And if you are going to pick it up, there's like a, I don't know, legendary edition or something. I'm not sure what they call it, but it has all the expansions. And that's the one to pick up nowadays. Uh, Star Trek Frontiers, I can't talk about. Uh, I haven't played it. Uh, it doesn't rate as well is about all I can say. I know they did remove the day and night cycle, which makes the game a little simpler and well gave it a Star Trek theme. I personally am a Trekkie. I dig the Star Trek theme, but Mage Knight, as Sean pointed out, and as I mentioned, is a very long game. And I just don't have the time to dedicate to it. So I've avoided both the new edition and the Star Trek version. I'm just trying to find that uh, that new version, and it's not showing up under uh, it's probably oh, the is. Lost, the, uh, the Ultimate Edition. There it is. Ultimate, yep. there 28, 2018, the Ultimate Edition of Mage Thanks. Knight. Yeah, I don't think it's a separate entry on Board Game Geek because they didn't really change anything. They just put it all no, together. No, it is actually. It wasn't on oh, the versions oh. of Board Game. That's that's the that was why I was having trouble finding it. Okay, so it is a different version. Uh, and it actually ups its difficulty to four point five on if they on that <laughs> yeah, version. Well, that's probably because all the expansions tossed in. There's even yeah. more going on. Yeah. 
All right, up next, I got Robinson Crusoe. You are family stranded on an island playing through a deck of cards. Now, the neat thing in this game is it's kind of a which way. You're going to get cards, and you're going to make decisions based on those cards, and you're going to have to make some skill checks. This, again, seems like a game that could be perfect for a pair where one person has accessibility problems and the other doesn't, because they should be that the person without the problems can, without the difficulties, can read off the cards while the other person can reply. So it's like a reading a which way book. It's, hey, do you want to go this way or this way? Talk about it together and make the decision. Roll the dice. Um, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't work. Uh, so when we're talking Robinson Crusoe, that is a very crowded search uh, on oh. Board Game Geek. Which Robinson Crusoe is it? Uh, it's from Portal Games. Portal Games. Uh... I think. <laughs> Because uh, yeah, yeah it's it by Ign Ignacy Trevishek. So the the it's adventures, adventures on, cursed islands. on the first island. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, re-implemented by my first Martians. Adventures on the Red Planet. Yes, not my first Martians. Just Sorry, first, yes, Martians. first Martians. Now I have heard first Martians is horrible. I, every time it, it's dirt cheap, it's online. I only hear about this because I share deals on it regularly, and people tend to point out that oh, not that POS again. Uh, so I don't know what's wrong with First Martians. I, it, it does have a significantly lower rating yeah. on Board Game Geek, so take that with uh, whatever grain of salt you'd uh, like. Yeah, I, I don't know what the difference is. Like, I do know a couple of the reasons, just thematically. What's more dramatic is you got bitten by a spider. What's going to happen? Or, ooh, dust got in the air vents. And just what the, <laughs> Im the, the mental impact when you're playing the game is. I've heard that complaint. I right. guess it also had one of the worst translated rule books ever made in board gaming. Ooh. So they have released a new one. So yeah, right. there is a Robinson Crusoe second edition. I have heard that. I don't know much about it, but I don't know. I, I personally got to say the, the first Martian sounds neater, but. <laughs> All right. And so that was Robinson Crusoe adventures on the cursed Island from 2012 is the original release. Yeah, it's been out for a while. That's it's 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 a little long in the tooth, but hey. Up next, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. This is a series of games. Uh, there's certain ones are ranked a little better. This is solve a mystery, and then get insulted by Sherlock Holmes at the end, where he tells you how he did it better than you, and you rank yourself versus how well you did compared to how well Sherlock did. Um, it's uh, again, this seems like the kind of game that as a partner, right? Like. The, the person with the cited problems is going to be able to take part in the discussions and the problem solving and the interactions and the what to do next. While they may not be able to read the clues or read the newspaper articles or check out the stuff on the board, they're going to be able to participate just by being another brain at the table and another person solving the problems. Right. There are a, there are a lot of pieces of this game. There are like, Yes. Um, and so I, is the, the original seems to be uh sherlock holmes consulting detective the thames murders and other cases i think that was the, the first original one but all, all of them are standalone like if they're not expansions you just buy right. whichever one you want to play okay um because yeah it's it's just again this is another one that's sort of a thousand uh a yeah, thousand things lot, show up well, lots of cases the problem with these games is from what i understand you can play them more than once but it's one of those you kind of know right, right. like you, you know the answer right so you can only play them so many times so they keep putting out more, which is going to go with another game we mentioned in two from now. <laughs> so the Sightless Fun blog actually strongly recommended this one and finds it very accessible. So this is one that right. I, say, I think is perfect for accessibility for a mixed group, right? Like this is also good if you've got a group of um, outgoing, boisterous players and shy players, this would be a good game for that because the, the amount of interaction can be changed. It's, it's, it's almost uh, more of an activity than a game. Uh, it looks like there's there there seems to be some sort of bouncing around with publishers between Asmodee and Space Cowboy. Uh, okay. The newest English version I can find is um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Thames Murders and Other Cases, Space Cowboys English Edition from 2018. All right. So. Which I think is a reprint of the original instead of a new one. I don't know. I think they're still coming up with new ones. Yeah. But uh, they seem to be reprinting it every single year. So, but be selling well, which I guess <laughs> yeah. is a good thing. No, absolutely. And then Ryan does point out there are lots of fan made cases out there as well. Yep. Uh, and again, so Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Thames Murders and Other Cases is the basic. 
All right, we already mentioned why I think deck builders work well for this. The thing is, there are not a lot of cooperative deck builders. There are some, because you get to lay out your whole hand, and then everyone can help you at the table. Most of the deck builders out there, it doesn't matter what order you play your cards in, so it's just a matter of, here's my flop, help me out with it. The one that is on the most list, recommended strongly, is Aeon's End. A lot of people are saying this is a great two-player cooperative experience. Personally, I have Aeon's End, and I don't know if they fixed it with a later edition, but I didn't find it all that amazing. The neat thing in Aeon's End is the fact that at the end of your turn, you decide what order your cards are discarded in, and you never shuffle your deck. To me, that sounds like it'd be difficult for someone with accessibility issues. Like, you'd have to have your, your partner basically tell you what order to put your cards in. I don't know. This did come up. Strongly recommended by many other people, and that's the main reason I threw it on the list. Like, even Sean pointed it out after just a cursory search yeah, that it was... this one comes up everywhere. <laughs> every I, every I personally, I was not a huge fan of Aeon's End. My copy's up for sale. It's back there right now. If you're in Windsor and you're interested, I'll sell it to you. Uh, and uh, I, Aeon's End Legacy is the new 2019 version, and it is not an expansion. Aeon's End is not required to play Aeon's End Legacy. So, Yeah, and that is a legacy game where you're destroying stuff. So I don't know that's a, a different ball game, but there are like five different printings of Aeon's End, which is yeah. part of the issue with the game. I have the original printing with the worst art and the bad cards, and then they put another one with new art because it did well enough and so on. Right. I have to say, I'm still not a huge fan of the art, but uh, it does say it, it does seem to be a wildly popular game. So, yeah. you know. And not every game's for everyone. This It's one that fell flat with my group. Right. Again, that was Aeon's End. All right, this is a big one that just came out this year. Everyone's going nuts for the latest dungeon crawler from Fantasy Flight, the the, the follow-up to Descent and Imperial Assault, Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle-Earth. From what I understand, because this is app-driven, assuming you're not completely blind, if, you're, if your vision is just impaired, that app takes care of a lot of the work for you and basically works as a helper for you. And it supposedly is really good two player and potentially best at two player. Interesting. And uh, so it's about a two hour game. Uh, again, BGG is saying best at two. Uh, yeah. And it's only, uh, it's, it's right there in the middle at about a 2.48. So, you know, 2.5. Yeah. That's right in that sort of sweet spot for weight. Now, I have heard people complain that it doesn't feel epic enough to be called Middle Earth because you're playing the little people. There's no, you're not delivering any one rings. You're never going to Isengard. You're you're doing more D and D style quests. And I've seen people note that it was uh, just not epic enough a feel for Lord of the Rings. Is the only complaint I've seen about it. And the people who complained that still had the caveat that it was still a great game. Right. It just they wanted epic. Like, come on, Lord of the Rings. It's huge. We should be traveling all over the world. I own this. I haven't gotten to it. It's I we're playing Gloomhaven. <laughs> That's my campaign game right now. Right. Uh, and it actually looks like uh, the um, the helper app is available on Steam. So right, right before Ryan was saying that it could be run on PC and while it apparently it is, it is actually available on Steam. So. All right. Uh, so Evil John points out the problem with the game is you can't swap people in and out of your campaign. So if part of your accessibility issue is that you can't make every game session, that could be a detriment to that particular game. But to be honest, for me right now, so John's kind of joined in partway through the chat. What we're looking for is two-player only cooperative games, games that are good for two players. So once you're down to only two players, I think once one player is out, you're not, you either have a whole group or you don't, right? Yep, yep. Uh, and so this is Lord of the Rings Journey in Middle, uh, Journeys in Middle-Earth. Yes. Yeah, and then again, this is the follow-up to Descent, and Ryan was saying Descent 2nd Edition was one of the more accessible games out there, so this should be a good follow-up because of the app. All right, getting back to the sitting down and the two of you being able to help each other out, we get to the Exit series of games. Now, The Abandoned Cabin is by far the highest rated of the series and lists best at two or three. Uh, Deanna and I played through an Exit game, there are going to be things you're not going to be able to do due to vision problems, but there's going to be lots you're going to be able to do without. It's you're, you're problem solving. You're doing logic puzzles. You're putting numbers in order. You're looking at physical arrangements of things. Uh, exit games are perfect for that. Like you just really want, um, it's, it, it's the interaction, right? The, the one player can read the book. The other player can 
do the math or do the figuring out or rearrange all this stuff. So I think the particularly the exit the game series that are completely card driven. So Ryan's saying that uh, ex uh, escape rooms are completely off the table. So now is that personal preference or for accessibility <laughs> reasons? Uh, I did probably a little bit of both. Maybe um, <laughs> I can definitely see some people. You know, for some people, escape rooms just don't do it and don't cut yeah. it. And I totally understand that. Uh, I've done one uh, real, like you know, real escape room where we it was actually you know fully paid for um mm. you know and it had lasers and smoke and things you know all out uh and it was enjoyable but i don't think i want to do it again really so um yeah i'm definitely with evil john uh as he's gotten older vision problems have become an issue you'll you'll hear me rant in most of my <laughs> unboxing videos about the size of text and then which and then light on dark or dark on light Yes, and everything, ne never, never do light text on dark background. Please, please stop doing that. <laughs> Although I have to say, I'm the guy who enables dark mode on everything, everywhere, for light on dark to on dark text. Yeah. But that's me. No, um, I, oh, yeah, we used a, we needed a magnifying glass to yeah. play an exit game. So, yeah, because yeah. everything's on small cards. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, like I said, where I, where I think the accessibility comes in is the fact that even with a group of four people, not everyone can look at the card at once normally when you're playing those games. So it's it's the problem solving aspect of having another brain at the table and someone else to bounce ideas off of, which is why I think the exit games are a good two player call for at least one, with one person with accessibility issues. They can be the, the the guy in the chair. Absolutely. I have to say uh, what my 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 limited experience is with the, the real escape rooms. I think they would have actually benefited from having someone visually disabled in them. Uh, because a lot of what they do in those escape rooms is putting things to distract you, yeah. um, you know, unnecessary things. So someone who can, who can not necessarily see that, but sort of take it all in. Uh, awesome. Uh, there is time right. pressure is definitely a challenge for non-visual play. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's yeah. Timers, timers yeah, definitely timer. are, are an issue. You're playing an exit game. Don't worry about the score. Play, play it for the <laughs> experience. Play to solve it and feel good about solving yeah. it. Try to solve it without using any clues, right? That should be your goal instead of solve it in two hours. Yeah. So now Will Chamberlain notes he prefers dark mode. Okay. I'm only complaining about printed text, rule books. Okay. I, I, text, green is better. Okay. Right? right now I am looking at my screen. It is black, dark gray with white <laughs> text. That is better. But printed text, I have a real hard time reading rule books that are black background or, or even worse, like starry dark backgrounds with things in right. them with bright text on top. Yep. All right. And so that was exit the game, the abandoned cabin. All right. Up next horrified. Uh, I only mentioned this because I played a two player to play pretty good. I got to say it. I'm certain it's better with more people. Uh, it was definitely a lot of fun with five people, but there's no reason you couldn't play it two people. Um, the icons are ridiculously clear. The only thing I realized they could have done to make it more accessible, and I wish they had, is if they had put a different shape for each of the three colors of the items. Now, yes, I realize when you're reaching in the bag, I guess you could technically feel the difference. But if they had just like added a different bump on each one or something, but that seems like something you could easily adjust, like putting a, a bump on each of them so you could tell the three colors. But besides that, the colors are bright primary colors. Uh, you don't have a red and a green. It's blue, yellow, and red. Yep. So I, is from what I understand of color blindness, that won't be an issue. The miniatures are miniatures, so you can t tell them apart, right? Like plus they're color coded. All the cards are also color coded with very little text. There is text, and the text there is is fairly large. Uh, I the think only from an accessibility working together two player game, yep. it could be a lot of fun. Uh, the only the only issue I'd have is the standees. Um, again, if you don't you need to figure out where you need to bring a citizen to, you you're a little. You know, you need a yeah. little help there because that reading that is can be difficulty. Mm. Yeah, Ryan does point out two different blind board game enthusiasts who are into the game. Now, just not his style, but that yeah. doesn't change it from not being a good two player interactive accessible game. Absolutely. And that is horrified. All right. Uh, nowadays, I don't think you can have a podcast without mentioning this game. So we're just checking off the box to say, yes, Tabletop Bellhop has talked about Tainted Grail. Everyone is going nuts for this game. This may be the next number one game. This could be the Gloomhaven killer. People are saying that it's that good. Uh, Board Game Geek saying it's great at two as well. Yep. 
And so that's Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. Uh, just released 2019. Yeah, it just came in from Kickstarter. People are, are loving it. This is, like I said, potentially the next Gloomhaven, the next story-based, campaign-based fantasy RPG set in the Arthurian period. Huge books. Which way? I don't know. People are going nuts for this thing. Personally, I haven't played it, but you know what? It took me two years to get into Gloomhaven, so <laughs> it's rocketing up the scales. We'll see. I Personally, I, I'm thinking right now there's a lot of people who spent a lot of money who are happy to get the thing they spent their money on and have, um, what do you call that? Buyer's, um, not buyer's remorse, the yeah, opposite. The, the, opposite the, the bias. A bias, buyer's bias, a yeah. price bias. They're, they're justifying yeah. their cost, but yeah. I could be wrong. Maybe the game's just that good. Uh, so yeah, as of right now, it is uh, 113 or 813th overall, but 112 on the thematic charts. So it yeah. is uh, and getting up there. Uh, and yes, that is from Awaken Realms, Stanister. Yeah. yeah, everyone's going nuts. So they, people are literally saying this could be the Gloomhaven killer. It could be could be the next number one game. We'll see. And once again, that is Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. Uh, so next up, uh, my entry for this one is actually Hogwarts Battle. Um, this is again where one where it's uh, it's a great four player game, but if you have two players, you each play two characters, uh, and it's really quite enjoyable. It's all open information; everything's up down on the table. Uh, there's no you know you you draw your hand and then lay it down on the table because it doesn't matter if anyone else knows mm -hmm. uh, what you've got or not. Um, so the open information; it's a great co op to work with people. Uh, and again, it's, it's one of those games where it's hard. Uh, so it's that, co it's that cooperative hardness you want to keep you coming back to it because you haven't just blown through the whole thing quickly. Uh, and if the original box isn't hard enough for you, that monster's <laughs> box of monsters is a killer. Uh, so yeah, uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is, uh, is my strong recommendation. Yeah, I didn't see that on anyone else's recommendation list, but it, I played it solid, played it with the girls. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of text on the cards, but no. it's definitely reading. It's definitely that deck building. Someone's going to have to read out all the cards. Yeah. But I think because of the iconography, especially for the spells, you could probably Yeah, no, learn absolutely. Both. There really isn't even that much reading, really. Uh, you get sort of uh, through it pretty quickly uh, once, you've, you know, once you've been through them and, and, you, and you associate yeah. uh, the pictures the symbol, with, the with things. Picture you with know, the, yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So... Uh, and then in the chat, we had uh, the mention of Street Masters early on, which is uh, very highly regarded, uh, looks like. It's uh, it's another one of those fighting game, uh, miniature battle sort of uh, games. Plays great at two with a really great BGG rating. That's one I don't know at all. I somehow missed that game. I know nothing about it. You said it, and I'm like, nope, never <laughs> even heard of it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's an 8.5 with a weight of 2.7. That's a two-player co-op, or uh, two or more, I think you said. Yeah, so it, they, they call it a one to four. The community says one to three, best one two. Okay, um, best one uh, two yeah. is a good sign. And it's, I mean, just looking at that front box, it looks like they've just ripped off a Street Fighter game. Um, it's. I you think know. what's interesting is that it's co-op. Yeah, like like there's all the like I really dig like we're, this is a totally different topic, but the Indines, the War of Indines, Devastation of Indines, which is a two-player. 2d fighter done as a board game but they're very much not co-op games that's right the, that's the exact opposite now it does look like it might be a th that much of a better game if you were jumped in on the kickstarter and picked oh, up all the stretch goals and things yeah it looks like they did uh pack it full of goodies but uh yeah uh Zanister says it's like the old side scrolling beat em up arcade oh, okay. games so basically right. yeah you, the old uh, the old double street dragon. fighter double dragon or double dragon than double dragon sorry yes Makes sense. Excellent. All right. Did we see anything else in the chat that anyone um, else recommended? Uh, we did get recommendations I saw for uh, Spirit Island, which we had mentioned earlier in the show. Thank you for joining us, Eric Laz. Yep. Uh, Ryan, Ryan's recommend, uh, mentioning um, Shadowfront Crossfire, co-op mode, okay. co mode Conquest of Planet Earth. So Shadowrun Crossfire seemed like a lot of text on those cards. Like compared to every other deck builder I've seen, like the the it makes that Arkham Horror look light. So I don't know about that. Like I've seen it, and I'm just like, man, there's a lot of stuff on those cards. Right. Uh, and he mentions uh, co-op Star Realms. Co-op Star Realms. That's a good idea. 
Star Realms is definitely a, a nice one. Again, any deck builder where you you don't you can play your cards in any order. Right. Where it's not one of those like uh like I don't think four worlds would be a good recommendation. Right. Where you may want to keep a card in your hand for next turn or say Tyrants of the Underdark, I think probably not a really good one, but those that's not cooperative. So, but Star Realms Cooperative, where you're fighting against, where you throw the the monsters, I, I actually, I tend to forget you can play Star Realms Cooperative. Uh, I would assume then Hero Realms, you can the same as well? I don't know myself. Because <laughs> uh, Hero Realms has a slightly higher rating, although I, I could just be, uh, I could just be a numbers, a numbers thing, because it's not statistically different, I don't think. And thank you, John, for the term confirmation bias. That was the one I was looking for. Yep. All right. I thought I had seen some more in the chat, but I think we're probably pretty good. So we got to ask Ryan, did we point out anything new to you? Did we find you a new game to check out? How was, did we do how our was job our, yeah, today? How was the suggestions from the bellhop? As we deal with uh, what uh, the little lag that's happening today? Eh, possibly. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Defenders, Defenders of the Realm, the realm. That's, that's the fantasy style pandemic like game where you're trying to defend against dragons which i've right. actually never played larry yeah. elmore artwork ryan loves uh defender the defenders there of the room, apparently there we go all right all the things that's awesome that one i didn't see on anyone's list i personally haven't played it right hmm. every time i join this channel i order another game Take hey, we're, we're doing something right. Take note, uh, publishers. <laughs> yes, take note, publishers. All right, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things that have been happening with our look... So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, new YouTube videos, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com blog where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, holidays are getting here close really close it's already december make sure you check out our gamer gift guides because we all know how hard it is to shop for a gamer because you never know what to get them what they already have what they want what they don't want what they've already other people have bought for them we got a bunch of gift suggestions that aren't just more games you can find these over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com by clicking on gift guides or get them directly from tabletopbellhop.com slash gifts all right, speaking of shopping, this is only for those of you in the chat because I have a feeling it's going to be dead by next Tuesday. Uh, right now, Amazon, if you are into RPGs, if you're into books, they have a $5 off every 20 you spend Amazon sale. Now, if you go there, it looks like you just get $5 off your book, but it's every 20. So if you buy a $60 RPG book, like for example, the Art and Arcana special edition for D&D that's $63, you get 15 bucks off. Deanna's going to drop a link in the chat. We would appreciate if you use that. They have all kinds of D&D, Pathfinder, Starfinder. There's a Call of Cthulhu. There's some Star Trek Adventures books. If you are shopping for RPGs, this is one of those sales you don't want to miss. All right. Good to know. Up next, a look at Imhotep, Builder of Egypt from Cosmos Games. All right. First off. Fair warning, Imhotep has nothing to do with the mummy or Brandon Fraser. Imhotep, Builder of Egypt, is an Egyptian-themed monument-building board game designed by Phil Walker Harding, featuring art by Miguel Coimbra and Michaela Kiente, or Klein, Killen. I apologize for the name there. Uh, published by Thames and Cosmos in, in 2016, I think it was. I got the wrong date there completely. 2016, uh, yeah. 2016, yeah was right on my my notes were wrong bad mode which means my blog post is probably wrong it's probably says 2019 it's published in 2016 i played it for the first time in 2019 uh plays two to four players with most games taking well under an hour and i think that is uh michaela kindla kindla yeah maybe kindla, K kindla is i believe the pronunciation all right but again i don't know what country yeah. she's 
they Probably are there Germany, from. But we'll, who knows? So thank you for the the <laughs> correction there, even though we still may be wrong. Yeah. Uh, all right. So for those of who haven't checked out our unboxing video on YouTube, what's in the box? All right. First off, you got an 11 page rule book, which is sitting on top of a bunch of punch boards. Rule books, full color, lots of examples, features tons of pictures that are actual gameplay components. Actual rules of the game are only two pages. The rest of the book are how to score each of the various boards that are in this game. The punch boards are some of the best cut I have ever touched. Boards and bits were falling off of these as I was trying to unbox the game. Stuff was falling on the floor when I was trying to show off the components on this one. By the time I was done unboxing video, most of the stuff had already been punched. Uh, cardboard's pretty much your standard thickness. Artwork's all very clear, nice and crisp, with a nice unifying sandy yellow uh, deserty theme to everything. Uh, main boards is notable that they're two-sided with A and B sides. So, and I'm I'm looking at the cubes. These could very well just be the cubes from uh, Minecraft. I mean, they are, you know, yep. same yep. color. I haven't are, gotten to the cubes yet, yeah. but yes. Yeah, they, I think they're the same size. So under the punch boards, uh, there's a really uniquely shaped box insert that's covered in all kinds of pretty images. And I don't get it because it serves no purpose whatsoever. It's like a weird oblong kind of shape. So it makes it the box not square anymore. I, maybe they were trying to go for a quarry pit feel. I don't know. Well, it's kind of pretty. There's no purpose to it. And I got to wonder, could my game have been a bit cheaper if they'd skipped this superfluous add-on? There's no point. I would have much preferred somewhere to actually put the components in the game. Like there's a deck of cards. Give me somewhere to put the cards. Um, this is the small rant compared to what I kind of went off about this on the unboxing video. I, I, I was unimpressed by this insert to say the least. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's it, for, to just to give you, give people a better picture who are listening. Uh, imagine if you take your box and then you shrink it down a little bit and turn it 45 degrees inside your other box. Yeah. That's what you're left with. Um, so you, you, they, they massively just basically cut off all four corners of the box for no reason other than art. Yeah. I, I just, I, I don't understand why. Now, in this little pit is a bunch of noteworthy cubes. Sean already mentioned these. These are huge compared to standard resource cubes. Like, these are not the cubes you get in any of your standard Euro games. Uh, these are painted wood. I'm going to guess they're about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter square. Uh, they're in four different colors, and there are a ton of them. Then there are the cards I mentioned. These are Hobbit-sized cards. Not a huge fan of Hobbit-sized cards. I prefer full-size cards, but they're they're fine. They're a good quick thickness good quality they're not overly slippery or anything uh there's two different sets in the deck market cards and boat cards final thing you get are plastic baggies which are appreciated especially because you gave me such a dumb box insert well at, at least companies seem to be of late anyway knock on wood getting the idea that at the very the very least thing you can do for your game is give us some ziplocs you know i mean even if nothing else comes in there Give us some Ziplocs so the box isn't a disaster. Yes, yes. So... So now that you know what you get, how do you play? All right, so in Imhotep, you are builders in Egypt trying to impress uh, the pharaoh Imhotep by moving stone from the quarry to build various monuments, moving stone by boat. Each monument is represented by a different central playing board, and there are four monument boards in the base game, and there's a market board. Each of these is also two-sided. Players are going to... Uh, the market board has where the cards go, where players can earn end-game scoring cards and some rule-breaking abilities. You can play with the boards laid out in any combination of A and B sides, though the game does recommend you start with A sides and move on to the B sides once you know the game. Uh, and these aren't big. I mean, these are... When it, when it comes to player board sizes, I mean, these aren't even the size of a, a terraforming Mars. No, board, no. Are, they're, they're small. But once you put them together, it, it's it's like... Uh, it's like a multi-part center board central area where you build basically your, your different work stations that, that the boats can stop right. at. But it's not a table hog by any means. No, not at all. Uh, the first time we played it was at a bar on a bar table. So There we go. Uh, each round starts by putting out a number of boats. These are little tiles that represent has space for cubes on them, for your cubes. Boats either fit one to four cubes. Uh, each turn, players are going to take one action. They're either going to get more stone from the quarry taking up to three cubes of their color, but only if they have room, because you can only hold five. Or load a boat by taking one of the cubes that's in your personal supply and putting it on a boat. Note you can put it anywhere 
on any one of the boats in any of the spots that isn't already taken, and each boat only has so much room. Or you can sail a boat. You take one of the boats that has a minimum amount of stone on it, and that varies by the size, and move it to one of the boards. Basically, the, the, they dock to it. There's a little spot where they kind of slot in. And then you unload the boat from front to back, which matters, because the order the cubes come out is a big part of scoring in the game. Each player's stone is going to be placed on the appropriate mining monument board in a different way, depending on where you're at. Now, the market board's a little different. All it determines is the order the cubes come off is who gets to draft the cards first, second, third, or fourth. Last choice is to play one of those market cards you've gotten in a previous turn. Uh, these are ways you can break the, break the rules, right? So they'll let you load a boat and ship the same turn or pull some stone straight from the quarry and put it on a monument, et cetera. There's a bunch of different cards. There's a reference sheet right on the back of the instruction book tells you what they all do. It's interesting. I mean, there's the, the, the size of the cubes, the looks of the cubes, the fact that you're building things out of these cubes. I feel like someone who designed Minecraft really likes Imhotep. <laughs> uh, it's is definitely possible <laughs> they are from two different companies though so yeah maybe yeah. maybe unless prospero hall also worked on uh or not members that I, of prospero not that hall. i can see well possibly members i don't know yeah uh, so so each monument board works differently and each score is differently some score points during the game others score only at the end of the game so without getting into full details here the burial mount as players trying to create orthogonally adjacent sets of their own blocks. Whereas the temple scores based on which blocks can be seen from the top layer of the structure with each layer of five going on top of the previous one. And then the obelisk scores different from that and the pyramid scores different than that. After six rounds of play, you do end game scoring, which includes the monument boards as well as some of the market cards, which also score at the end of the game. Those tend to be based on what got built in different spots. Builder with most points wins, Imhotep's favor, and wins the game. Excellent. Uh, and I'm just noticing that the uh, the designer for this game also worked on Gizmos and Sushi Go. So yeah, that, uh, definitely, it's, it's, he's your kind of your kind of designer, apparently. Yep. No, I agree. Phil Walker Harding's a great designer. I'm a big fan. Now I've been hooked on Imhotep since the first time I broke it out. I already mentioned this. It was at a bar. It was on a double date night with Tori and Cat at the Sandwich Brewing Company. Um, since then, I brought it out to multiple playing public play game nights. I've had it out on my Monday night games. I've had it out at uh, parties. Um, I played with hardcore Euro players as well as players whose only gaming experience included Sori and Monopoly at the time. And while well, I taught them Gokuku first, so they had a little bit in there. Uh, the only thing that has been common in all these plays is that every single person I've taught this game to has enjoyed it. Excellent. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, pretty hard to beat, right? If yeah. uh, if if you teach it to a, a wide range of people and everybody can't get mm -hmm. enough of it, that's saying something. I mean, yeah. uh... now one of the biggest appeals that I've found is how easy it is to teach this game. Like basically, what I just taught you, the only thing I would have to do in addition to that is explain how the boards work, depending on which sides are up. Like that's it. There's three options: I, I take stone, I put stone, or I ship stone, or I have cards that break those rules. That's it. Like it, it takes under 10 minutes to explain this game and setup is ridiculously quick. You just throw the tiles out, you build the quarry by just dumping all your pieces out. You each take a set of stone, and you start going. The mechanics are dead simple, but what's even more impressive is how deep the strategy and tactics in this game are. Once you start playing, this is one of those games where players have a Eureka moment, right? Where you're playing and you're like, yeah, 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 I moved stone. You're like, oh, wait, I get it. Oh, there's more to it. And in this game, it's usually when you notice that it's not as much about what you're doing on your own. It's more about watching what everyone else is doing and potentially even more importantly, what you think everyone else is planning to do next. Right. Uh, it's, it's great when the game is there in front of you, but the actions and the players are... The more important part right it's that it's yeah. that interaction where you don't spend the time staring at the board so much mm -hmm. as analyzing the game that has been played and will be played in the future it's that chess thing right it's the you, you don't need to see you don't need to see a chess board for the most part you just need to know what the moves are and you can picture the whole board in your head it's that thinking and planning of what's come before and what's coming after to see mm -hmm. where things are going to go that makes uh, for some really great games and then there's this, the, the fact you have the two-sided boards. That's just a huge bonus. Now, I haven't done the math. I know with the expansion, it's 10 
there are 1,028 different possibilities. I'm not sure what the combination is in the base game. It should be half that if, if my math is right, but like you're going to start off with the A-sides and there's a reason for that because the A-sides are a little bit simpler. Now the B-sides aren't harder, but what tends to happen on the B-sides is that you not only get points, you get something else for doing something. So it's a little harder to teach, but they're not hard to learn. And it's that ability to combo them. Like literally I saw someone online had written down every possible combination and are crossing them off as they play it because there's no way they're going to play Imhotep a thousand times. So this way each game is going to be unique. And I think that's fantastic. That's a crazy amount of replayability. Yep. And, and, and that's assume, and even if they are, and even if you don't flip them all, I, I, you know, there's still going to be some replayability based on who's at the table with you. Well, yes. Yeah, even if even if you always play with the A-sides. I have played many games with the A-sides because I'm often teaching new players, and I'm not sick of them. I still have a great time playing. Excellent. So I'm sure you can tell I dig Imhotep. Um, this, at this point, may just be the best gateway game in my collection. Uh, it's honestly replaced Azul. The, the, well, for a whole year, this podcast, I, we couldn't go a show without talking <laughs> about Azul. But this is now the game I bring to every event where I know there's going to be new gamers. There's a chance there's going to be new gamers showing up and I'm going to have to teach them something new. I, I, the thing is, this is easier to teach than Azul. It's quicker to teach and I find the themes more approachable. Everyone gets building the pyramid, you're stacking blocks. Building obelisks, you stack blocks. It just as opposed to you're building a stained glass thing with this abstract pattern. And I got to say, it's got just about as striking a table presence, though in a different way than Azul. Like Azul's got its pretty tiles and its nice tactile. Well, so does this has these nice, large wooden blocks. Uh, to me, this game is pretty much a solid buy for any game collection, especially if you often game with new or inexperienced gamers. If you run a gaming club or if you've got a local game store, this is a game you should have a demo copy available. This is a game that should be available on game nights. Even if you don't play with newer gamers, though, your experienced gamers are likely going to dig this as well. There is enough depth there. So again, we're here. We're here talking about Imhotep. It is rated right now a seven point two. Uh, it's seventieth overall in family games. Uh, it's a forty minute play with a two point oh rating, basically. So it's accessible. It's quick, uh, and it's well loved by everyone who's played it. Apparently, so great for a more at least locally. I've, yeah. I've yet to have someone go, "Eh, that wasn't for me." And it's heavy enough. We featured it in a board game blitz. Like this, it's a tournament worthy game. Because I has one thing, too, that's kind of neat with this game is I have had very different play experiences with it. I've had the play experience where we're having a couple drinks, we're eating charcuterie, and we're playing and kind of half paying attention and enjoying the social atmosphere. And I played the heavy game where everyone's sitting, leaning on their, their chins and thinking every move out and trying to predict. And I played a game where it felt almost like a social deduction game where players are lying to each other. We're like, oh, are you going to go ship there? Well, oh, I'll put my boat on there if you ship there. You're going to ship there? Okay, I'll put my stone there. And then they ship somewhere else, right? Like, right. I've actually seen those three different types of gameplay all happen with the same game. Great. Well, for a more in-depth look at Imhotep, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables or not? <laughs> yeah, every week we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So at this chance, I got to remove that. We no longer do that. No. Oh. So that's worth noting. I no longer post a week in review. It wasn't getting the hits. I just talk about it here on our podcast. So if you want to know what we're playing, the only place you're going to get that info is if you tune into our podcast or you join us live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. All right, so this past week was um, all the sales, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Cyber Week, Orange Thursday, whatever silly, stupid shopping holiday name companies have come up with in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Deanna and I have been way too busy to actually sit down at a table and play any games. Uh, I got to say it, affiliate sales help keep the roof over our head and pay our bills and make things like this podcast possible. So I do appreciate everyone who has bought and will buy something through our deal links. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, again, we don't, uh, we don't really get any income at all from this podcast other than our wonderful patrons and subscribers here on Twitch. Uh, everything else comes from affiliate links for, for Mo. 
Uh, luckily, I I'm fully donating everything, <laughs> my time and time and stuff yes, to this podcast because I, I have a full time job. Um, and so uh, you know, I I'm I'm happy to donate all I can, but uh, you know, they still gotta feed feed the kids. Yes, we do. Now, just because I haven't played any physical games doesn't mean I haven't played anything at all. I've still been playing some stuff on Board Game Arena. We haven't talked about Board Game Arena in a long time. I actually can't remember the last time we brought it up on the show. For a while, we were including it in our Week in Reviews because it was new and cool to us, and we hadn't done it before. But, like, we're still playing stuff on Board Game Arena, so I thought this week for this segment, well, be this would be a good chance to let people know what we've been up to gaming online. Absolutely, and, I mean, I... I keep very busy on board game arena because I don't have regular uh, play groups that I play with here in, uh, in Hamilton. Uh, my main board game outlet is board game arena and some uh, wonderful people we've met there and, uh, and play with. So the, the one game we've always got going and this started from, we, we found about, well, I knew about board game arena, but it was Eric Franklin who um, game time, T H Y M E who, basically introduced it to us like basically said hey check it out maybe you've seen it at one point take a look at what they're doing now it's pretty impressive um at the time eric and his wife were cool enough to actually gift us with a, a subscription for one year which was awesome and we got to get into a bunch of games but like since that started i don't know what is it two and a half years ago a year and a half ago whatever a long time ago we have had never ending games of seven wonders going <laughs> like i it just we're yep. always constantly playing seven wonders uh, it's a great implementation, but I've got to admit, I don't even, I, I almost click randomly anymore. <laughs> like, I probably should stop playing Seven Wonders because I'm just like, yeah, yeah, Seven Wonders. Well, I have to say, it was much better to have the never-ending game of Seven Wonders than it was to have the multiple games of Seven Wonders. Yes. Because those was... just blur into one big game, and that gets really messy really fast. Um, I have to say... I, my seven my seven wonders game has really improved by doing oh. it as much as it have because I am actually still sort of playing and uh, I'm paying more I'm paying more attention to other people than I ever did when I actually sat down at a table and did it. There you go. So I don't know. I I just I haven't been able to focus on that recently. I'm sure the, what I'd like to do now is play the physical game because I haven't played the physical game since our launch party, which was before yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. That's the last time I've actually played my physical copy of Seven Wonders. And I'm like, I feel I am a way better Seven Wonders player than I ever was. <laughs> I just don't care anymore on the online games. Don't yep. tell Eric. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the random element because I'm just going to buy random stuff because I'm like, oh, Seven Wonders. Because what happens if, if you haven't been on Board Game Arena, once you start a bunch of games, it just comes up with notifications saying you are, it's your turn on X tables. And you click and you take your turn and you hit next table. And I'm always like, oh, oh, there's the Seven Wonders table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get to one of the good games. So, and I've never, I got to admit, I've never been a huge Seven Wonders fan in the first place either. So, yep. Uh, so All right, step. the other one, the yep. other one I've been playing a lot of, uh, I don't even know who's in our game right now. <laughs> We've been playing with various different groups of people and I, I don't always watch who I'm playing with is Race for the Galaxy. Now, this is the one that when we first started talking about totally flopped for Sean because, man, it you don't learn this game through here. But once you know Race for the Galaxy, it is really well done on Board Game Arena and it is really quick to play. The only problem is you should just sit down and play a whole game, which is what we don't do. Yeah. And my problem is I forget my strategy. I forget what I was going for. I forget what I was doing. Yeah, no, I'd roll, roll for the uh, Race for the Galaxy is, again, one of those games where so much is going on or can be going on that 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 delay that gets introduced with yeah. the digital games can be tough. Uh, what I do a lot of is uh, I don't play any race for the galaxy. I play a role. I've got an ongoing role for the galaxy game. OK, uh, whereas that one I find is a little easier to keep track of and, and sort of pace yourself on. Um, you can kind of see where you were going. Yeah, by where I'm, the board I'm a little is. I'm a little hit and miss on it. I still think I should get it down physically sometime to see if there's something I'm missing. Right. Um, because again, I am really hit and miss, but uh, um, that's that. Uh, uh, appreciate the cheer there, Zanister. Yeah, I haven't tried Roll on there at all. I haven't played Roll. Roll is one of those games where it's now been long enough, I would have to like totally reread the rules. You know what? Like you I... wouldn't. You really wouldn't because you play Race no. of the Galaxy oh. all the time. It's, I don't know. I I remember trying to break it out sometimes. Someone asked me because it, it's one of those games that fell to the the box insert problem, where I got a box insert for it and all the expansions, so 
So I did the big box insert thing and the expansion thing, and I don't think I played my copy since, which tends to happen often. Right. I've said the BGA implementation is very well done. It's very straightforward. Everything's clear, uh, and and it, it's it just seems like it's much easier than you know fiddling with the cards and flipping yeah, cards cool. and stacking cards and uh, you know throwing dice well, in your cup yeah, or not. Roll actually doesn't have any cards in it. Well, it's got the little. It's it's all shits. It's all cardboard tokens. Yeah, yeah. It, it's all tiles. 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 Um, tiles and dice. Does it have the expansion? Because that was one thing I found. That I didn't I don't... like base roll for the <laughs> galaxy that much, but I really like the expansion. Uh, that I don't know if it has the expansion I'm playing or not. Okay. Could be. Um, yeah, I, I personally like roll was okay. I preferred race. Once roll added the expansion, I really liked it because I found in roll it was really hard to get your engine going at the beginning. Yeah, and the first no, it like, is. It absolutely 15, 20 is. minutes of the game are kind of boring. And yep. like you could almost just cut it out. And that's what the expansion does is it gives you a couple dice that have multiple sides on them, multiple okay. symbols on one die. And it gives you a bit of an engine at the beginning of the game to kind of get things rolling. And I found that really improved it. Uh, it doesn't look like it does, but uh, I find that the first couple of games, uh, the first couple of rounds depends. It really depends on where you go, because usually you've got a, a, an option between um, either like a six dice development or a three dice development and you can choose for to you know play that long game with a powerful going for the right. powerful card or get some more cards on the table or get next or shits or whatever on the table it, quick yeah. get some more developments down quickly uh and not uh, and not worry about getting in, getting the more powerful dice rearranging moves cool. so yeah i'll have to check that out at some point yeah all right you and i should just play one game one night or something quick yeah live all right, the big one, the one I'm having the most fun playing, the one that is definitely the most enjoyable is Through the Ages. Now, I know everyone's nuts on the Steam implementation and the iOS implementation. They're supposedly amazing. They probably are, but they cost money. This is free. So I am getting to play Through the Ages with Deanna and Sean. The game is still best at three players, as far as I can tell. We have been playing game after game, but man, this is another game where I, I should almost take notes. Like I should have a notepad <laughs> file for through the ages. Well, they, they that does, there me, is a note. There is a note functionality yeah, in the game. But I should use it. Yeah, I, yeah. Should, I should use it because like I, I get in and I'm like, wait, why did I buy that card? <laughs> and like, I, or I know I took the get three stone or three grain because I planned on doing something with something. And I don't know why, because now when I'm looking at my cards, I don't, I'm like, well, why wouldn't I, why did I take that card last time? So yeah, I, it is a fantastic implementation of through the ages. Um, it's a little rough to learn again, uh, especially yep. if you haven't played or at least seen the physical game. And I got to admit, even from someone who had played through the ages, not a ton of times, but a handful of times physically enough times I should know better. I had a hard time figuring out how to do a few things <laughs> and there's still some stuff I don't understand Yeah, where every now and then I'm like, wait, I don't understand how that happened. Like why it, I don't know. There's been a couple things with colonies that haven't made sense to me still. And oh my God, it suffers from the board game arena problem of making me hit a button to say I can't do anything when I can't do anything. Yep. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. The the when you when when someone has uh, bid more than you can possibly bid for something, why are you making me skip? You know, yes. you can see you know my cards better than I do. Because <laughs> um, every once in a while, it'll tell me something, and I'll and I'll you like racking my brain and go, oh no, I, I really can't possibly bid on this. There is no, you know, I have one army. Why are you asking me if I can outbid seven? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And to be honest, there's that's my biggest complaint. Well, two. There's two big complaints about Board Game Arena. One is that the 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 you're playing Race for the Galaxy and it says it is the settle phase, pick a planet to settle, and I have no cards in my hand. Or I right. have all developments, or the only planet I have costs five and I have no way to play it. Like, yeah. why why are you even asking me? um eminent domain was just as bad where it's like do you want to follow or dissent i'm like well i don't have any of the cards so i can't follow can't you just dissent for me or right. through the ages often the, especially the bidding or the aggressions or the play military cards for defense i don't have any <laughs> why are you even asking me yep that, yep that gets frustrated yeah no absolutely and that's and that seems to be a pretty universal problem on board game arena they've made a a active choice to always give you the the yes no ability you know always give you that that confirmation step um and i i think i understand why they were why they were th what they were thinking when they went in that direction but i think they could back off on 
doing that hard. Uh, yeah. Like to be yeah. honest, like I'm sure some of it is so you realize what happened. Yep. Because if it just happens, that's the other problem I've had is I I'll, I'll log in and I'll be like, well, wait, where did that thing I thought I had go? And it ends up that someone played an event two turns ago where the person with the lowest civilization right. loses a monument, and I it never told me it was played. So. But at least I mean the the right there and there there's the column of moves, so yeah. you can always look back and. And see yeah. that at least. So, you know, again, I don't usually use that. So I run into that same problem sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And I forget it's to there, look back. But it's, it's noticing that it's there. Yeah, yeah you actually have to pay attention. Which again, uh, it goes with the, if we just sat down and played, which we have done. And it plays really good if you play real time. Yeah, no, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really loving it. It was a rough one to pick up, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I, I struggled in the early games, even though we were playing on that basic level where, where it didn't get yeah. crazy with the attacking. There was no attack and no aggression. It was, no it was still, I was still struggling. And uh, I only feel like in, I think the last game we played, I really felt like I yeah. was comfortable. But that's something that's going to happen even with the board game. It is not a light game. Yeah, it yeah. is, it is the, the best rated it's, it's, it was top five. I don't know where it is now, right. but it, it is, it is not a light game and there is a learning curve in the game. Right. Speaking of learning curves, the other games Deanna and I keep continuing to play is Terra Mystica. I still have not played all the races. I'm getting close. I'm getting all close. I, I can't even... Dwarves were interesting. I played those last time with the tunneling. I am now playing a race where I get points for building bridges. I don't remember what race it is, but they're gray. I am really digging Terra Mystica on there. That is a really good implementation. The board's very well represented. The tracks are very well represented. Uh, the only thing I find in this one is I wish there was an undo button now and then because I've accidentally clicked on stuff. Like I'll click on a territory to do something and it, it'll do it and I meant to like scroll the map type of thing. Right. Um, which is leads me to my last complaint about Board Game Arena is, man, I wish there was an undo button in general. Uh, that's one thing Through the Ages is good for. Yep. Through the Ages has an undo. You can undo your entire turn and start oh, no. over. You can only undo your entire yes, turn. So if you can make one, one bad click at the end of your turn... Yes. You better remember what what steps you took all the way to get there. That's true. That's true. But at least it has an undo. <laughs> it does. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, I, again, yeah. So uh, through the ages is right now on BGG uh, number three strategy, number four overall. Four. Yeah, as I yeah. said, it's top five. And yeah. I mean, it's a four point three eight. So it's probably yeah, one of the heavier heavy. games I play ever. Because um, again, I'm not. It's a big game. I'm not like D. I don't go for the. I don't go for the brain burners. Yeah. Generally. Um, I still find it much easier to play in person. I don't know, just being able to see everyone else's boards in front of me and yep. see what people are drafting. No, I, I pay way more attention to what other people are doing when I play in person, which I actually find I play way better. Yeah, I well, that, and that's, better. that's one of the, the big problems with BGA. It's one of the problems we've all had, I think, with Seven Wonders at times is there, you know, uh, because it's not all right there on the screen in front of me, unless you've got, you know, a giant monitor scroll, of some sort. Yeah you're not paying as much attention to the other players because they aren't, I mean, there is no person there, right? There's no person yeah. to look at. There are just some cards somewhere else on the screen. And that's a problematic aspect of the entire idea of BGA. Um, or probably playing any game. Yeah, digital game, digital games online. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons yeah. why people use icons and faces and things in gaming online is so that you've got that, focus point to remember that yeah yeah there's a human there's, there's another player that i need to think about because they're trying to kick my butt <laughs> the game i think suffered the most for that was i didn't really enjoy playing king domino on board game arena like it works functionally yeah. it's great but like i had such a hard time keeping track of what everyone else is doing when i played king domino i was like i was more worried about my own thing and i'm like man i should be hate drafting but i had to scroll down and look at your maps instead of my map if that happens so I don't know. Okay. And D is saying she doesn't have a problem with that. So eh, you know, that's why yeah, she keeps winning. Yep. Yeah, could be. Could very well be. Um, games I'm playing, uh, I've got a uh, on, on a never ending game of Saboteur that's happening, which is interesting. So you know what? I have to say it's fun. And it's gotten to the point now where we are actually kibitzing each other in the chat. Um, <laughs> there every once in a while. Need, right? It's a yeah. social deduction game. Like, how do you play a social deduction game over digital without. <laughs> Every, the, the, every once in a while, you know, uh, Eric will pop in or one of the other people will pop in and say, hey, just, you know, do this because I'm trying to help everyone out. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, that they, you know, they're, they're doing things. And uh, I've actually been uh, working uh, whenever I get the saboteur card. Um, 
I've actually been working on trying to see how least, you know, how I can be uh, problematic in the least disruptive way. So it's like, I'm putting cards down, but hey, is he putting that card there because he doesn't have anything else in his hand that he can play and he just wants to play? Right. Yeah, or is yeah. he playing it because he's actually trying to mess with our lives? Uh, yeah. And so that's been my, that's what I've been getting out of the game lately is is trying to see what I can do to, to you know, distract people from what my actual goal might be. And so that's Great. been fun. Uh, and then Innovation is another one that is still a really weird game. Um, I've only played that one physically once. Uh, a friend brought it out to, I think it was an Extra Life event okay. at Brimstone back at their old location on Walker Road. And I just didn't get it. Like, like I, it, I don't know, weird. there was like I mean, 10 rounds and you displayed the cards oh, one yeah. way and then something would happen and yeah. display them the other way. And like the other players loved it. Like they were into it. Yeah. Uh, the, the person who brought it actually had like a custom wooden table built for it. Like oh, they were okay. really yeah. into innovation. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of those games where I think that, I think it's, it's you know, you're going to love it or you're not going to get it. You're not going to hate it. You're yeah. just going to go. What? Yeah, I didn't and hate it. I was just like, the, I, I mean, the first time I be doing. <laughs> the first time I played, I actually won, not because I had any idea what I was doing, but because the other players forgot that the winning, uh, uh, what, the, you know, what I, what I needed, what you needed to win was different in a four player game than it was for the two player games that they'd been playing. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> I, I, I got the fourth achievement I needed and won. And they were like, Oh, shoot we were used to using you know needing six or whatever it was i i, I don't know what the the actual number was so i i snuck in a win accidentally that way uh and i have not come not come close since but it's one of these games where every time you play a card there is this ripple of effects that flows out from the your actions and and causes the entire board to change in, in many ways yeah. um and and it's it's you know I think you would probably really enjoy it because of the the engine nature, except it's very it's very not a straightforward engine. It's a fu yeah. far more sort of ethereal engine, uh, the way things play. Uh, and I, I haven't. Know, I, I need to play it more. Yeah, I, this this is one where I went and watched. I think it was a Rado plays it or something like that mm -hmm. because I just wasn't really clear, and it, he didn't really explain the game, but at least it made sense what was happening. So that the next time Why I played, were happening. yeah. So the next time I played, I knew what to look for. I'm like, oh, this has got a leaf on it, but you know, player three has got nine leaves already out. So if I play this, I'm doing them more good than me, and things like that. You know, it's it's there's a whole lot of this. Hey, I right. can play this, and it'll help me, but it's going to help everybody else at the table more. Uh, and Fair. watching watching out for stuff like that. Um. Can't stop always. I mean, we, we sometimes will play like six games of that a day. Um, it's just such a fast I, game. I, I played that like twice. I played it because you <laughs> have to play it when you log Man. in. And I played it once after because I think it was Deanna was asking me what it, it was. <laughs> so I showed it to her. I still want a copy of that. Like I want right. that's for a gateway game. Like that's a especially like easy mode, right? Yeah, Where oh, absolutely. people are having pints of beer. That's that's the kind of game that's yeah. a push your luck, dice rolling, simple yeah. game. Well, it's but it's like, not it's... cheap because of that plastic yeah. top sign. Yeah. And it's just one of those games where I mean, we think we all just kind of it's the throwaway game because you don't have to, you know, you're, you're just rolling dice and, and moving yeah, on. That's so it's how like, I play seven wonders. And so we've got, you know, we will often do like three or four games a day, depending on when everyone's been signed on at the same time sort of thing. If we can birth, pull through it. Uh, Takedo, right, so, yeah. Oh, you're still doing Takedo. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were Takedo, doing Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Takedo, Hanabi, uh, Carcassonne. And... Oh, geez. Yeah, Sean's got a lot going on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, if you want to go on more, no, free. no. I mean, the only, the only one is high is Haggis has been fun. I mean, it's a trick taking game, but it's got some really interesting, um, aspects. Like there's a betting aspect of it, uh, that, that, that plays nicely. Uh, Takedo, yeah, we've spoken way Haggis. too much about, so we don't need, we don't need to talk about Takedo anymore. That's for sure. Yeah. It's like Takedo. I <laughs> finally backed out of Takedo. I was just, I, I had like six games going at once and I could never remember what I was collecting each one. Right. And it was getting to the point where I actually won like five in a row and I'm like, I'm going to back down. I'm actually good at this one. Well, we, you know, we're locked in and we've got that three player and that's the, uh, to me with three crossroads, is three is the sweet spot. I love it. It's, it's both cutthroat and, and soothing in the right, in the right yeah. balance. So. All right, so an invitation to everyone in the chat, anyone listening to us, um, add us on friends. Uh, I'm Tabletop Bellhop, one word, same as everywhere. And I'm Dark I, Elf LX, same as everywhere. 
Yeah, Dark Elf LX, D A R K E L F L X, and Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We'd love to game with you online. I, we, yep. we might even be able to pick a night of the week to do something like that and try to do that. But invite us to a game and we'll try to join in. Yep. We it, It's something we can do in the middle. I, I spend a lot of time in front of my computer, as does Sean. So it's a nice distraction between posting daily deals on tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. Absolutely. Uh, so for a look ahead, now that uh, some of the worst of the <laughs> cyber deals are over, uh, what have you got planned for the coming week? All right. Unfortunately, they're not all over. Like, literally, we're at the point now where it's set an alarm for 3 a.m. every night to see what the daily deal is. Uh, today was Fantasy Flight Star Wars games, which was good to see. So there was a whole bunch of those and then Play Monster games. But every day I get up at 3 a.m. Uh, there is no local gaming event that I know of going on this Saturday. Um, so I've got nothing to run. I might try to get a group together. The big thing going on this weekend, though, is our big family Christmas party. So... That is not a gaming event for us. Um, I did talk about how some games failed, but now we just, as the, as the family has shrunk, as people have gotten older and passed on, unfortunately, the, the the family's getting smaller and not a lot of kids in the family. We just t get together at a restaurant. So we will be going for some of the best pizza in Windsor this year. So I'm looking forward to that, but that has nothing to do with gaming. Uh, Saturday night, maybe we'll get something in. Maybe we'll try to get some gaming in, but I got nothing Saturday. But what's important for those of you listening to the podcast is the 14th we are back at cg realm uh from 5 till 10 p.m uh no specific game that i know of being featured at this point but we will be doing public play open inclusive family friendly gaming 5 till 10 p.m saturday the 14th of december and then on the 21st the week after we are back at easy mode back on a saturday saturday again 5 till 10 p.m uh, that game tends to get out a lot of new gamers, a lot more party games, lighter games, um, people actually playing stuff like Monopoly, not ironically, which is perfectly cool. Not every game is for everyone. They they have a great time playing party games and uh, stuff like that. And we also get a group of heavy gamers that bring out stuff. Underwater Cities has been big pop lately, and um, uh, they keep bringing out Abomination, Heir to Frankenstein, keeps seeing played at mm -hmm. easy mode events. But I don't know. No, knowing Chad, he's probably on to something else by now. And he'll bring that. So we'll see. I don't know if anything's going to happen this week. We'll we'll see in the next week next week's week in review if we actually get any actual gaming and physical at the table gaming. All right. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Evil John happens to be in our chat room tonight. Coincidentally, thank you for being a patron, John. Wayne Humphrey, thank you. Roger Malash, I hope the prototyping is going well. David Miller Jr., thanks. Roger Linscott Jr., thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347, Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here uh, every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop gaming podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.